Welcome back, and let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today we finally get our readings to focus on the birth of Christ. We're now in the third week of Advent. We've only got a week to go because of how Christmas falls this year. And we're now finally starting to look to the crib. And so it's, again, just a beautiful realization. Again, our preparation ultimately is for that second coming of Christ. And then we look backwards. Just briefly, our psalm today, Psalm 72, is a great summary of the work that Christ is going to come to do to fix those who are broken and those who maybe feel like the Lord has abandoned them, that God is going to come and take care of them. It also ties in beautifully with Mary's Magnificat that we had yesterday. So maybe just encourage praying with that on your own. I want to speak briefly about our gospel. It's Matthew's account of the birth of Christ, and it's a lot of things that we can pray with, but I want to talk about a couple of small points. We're told that when Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together. And so first thing is to acknowledge what this is. This means that Mary and Joseph were married. So the process to get married at this time in the Jewish faith that was different than what we have in our culture today. It could take up to a year between when they get married and when they come to live together. The way that Matthew is saying this is he's trying to emphasize the virginity of Mary, that they haven't come to live together, that there's no way that they could have conceived this child in a normal way. So he's just trying to draw that point home to his Jewish audience, which is who Matthew is writing his gospel primarily for. Sort of put it in our terms that at least if we live out life the way that we're supposed to, the way that God intends us to and the church encourages us to, so we can be in line with God's will, would sort of be that this is the time between the wedding at the church and the wedding night, when the spouses come together for the first time. And so this, again, is drawn out into a time that could take up to a year. And so um, the angel comes to Mary in that time, Holy Spirit overshadows her, and she conceives Jesus within her womb. And then Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. And a lot just in that beautiful sentence right there. Joseph was a righteous man, so we can obviously go in a lot of different ways in our prayer there. But he doesn't want to expose her to shame because, according to the law, and we see this carried on a couple of decades later, about three decades later, with the woman caught in adultery, is that Mary could have been stoned to death. And so we just want to pause for a moment and, of course, acknowledge that Joseph is trying to save her that possibility, but also take a step back to Mary's yes, understanding that's a part of the cross that she had to carry. We, of course, just can see the the difficulty of having to make that traveling because of the census and not being able to give birth at home and all the difficulty around the birth itself. But there was a lot of struggle that would have been present as well in that time. There's also probably some not easy conversations with Joseph, even though it's rooted in God's will. Joseph has trouble accepting this. And there are a few different reasons why this might be. One, Joseph may have thought that Mary was unfaithful, that something had happened, and uh, which would be a natural reaction for a man if you find out that your wife is pregnant. That's what you would naturally assume. And so Joseph might have that going on. There might be some acknowledgement of Joseph hears the story of Mary. He knows Mary's holiness, and he automatically believes what she has said. And he acknowledges that he is not holy enough to be near what God is doing in the world, what God is doing in his wife, within his family. Or, and this is my speculation, the church does have an official teaching which school of thought is right, is that it's probably some combination of both. If I look at my own life, and Joseph was a sinner, although tradition holds he didn't give into any grave sin, he's a sinner like us. And when we look at some of the struggles and the trials that we've gone through, we can sort of have that tension within us of not quite ready to receive the truth before us, but also having a hint of how awesome something might be. We maybe get those glimpses in some of our relationships and maybe some of the struggles we've had in our own lives. Maybe spend some time just reflecting on your own encounters. But I think just Joseph being a human being probably had some sort of tension within him um, or maybe some phasing from one to the other as a story unfolded because he was a man who had to deal with these things just like any other human being would. And sometimes we don't always sit and pray with that. But then Joseph 
ready to divorce her, and we're told that was his intention when the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. And it goes on again to say that his name will be Jesus, so he will save people from his sins. And then Joseph continues on, takes Mary into his home, and they continue their married life together, fulfilling again Mary's promise of virginity perpetually. And so what we see, again, that struggle of Joseph, then we see his complete and radical trust, much like Mary when she says, let it be done to me according to thy word to Gabriel. Now Joseph has a little bit of a hiccup at the beginning. He's a sinner. Mary isn't. And so just something beautiful there to pray with, but ultimately his radical trust. And then second, and this is just the last thing to maybe keep in the back of our mind. Sometimes we don't want to pray when we're tired, or when we're distracted, because we're afraid that we're going to fall asleep, or our mind is going to wander. Don't ever let that stop you from praying. Always show up, show up and pray and do the best that you can. I learned in college that whenever we fall asleep in prayer, we just call it our St. Joseph devotion. God can still do his work within us. If we show up and do the best that we can, God is still going to shower us with his grace. Now, we don't use it as an excuse to fall asleep and just say, I'm going to go to the chapel or I'm going to go to adoration and just fall asleep, that intention. But it is okay if it happens, if that's just sort of where we are today. We get a lot of beautiful things as we continue in this Advent season preparing for Christmas. Maybe sit with a couple of these images and try to put ourselves in the story as best we can and ask God to speak to us about how these things relate to our own life. But as we continue this Advent journey, let us pray for one another. God bless.